Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Are you in a dark moment? Maybe coming out of one, maybe going into one. I want you to know that just as every day will include the dark of night, so even the most enchanted life will include moments of extreme darkness. But you must understand about these moments of darkness. It is in the dark moments that we see that God shows up and shines brightly. Help is on the Way is a four-week sermon series that will explore four biblical stories of individuals in the Bible who were at the moment of greatest darkness, and God shines up and shows up like never before. Let me, let me state this as I begin the entire four-week series, that no matter how dark the moment, you don't need to fear, for help is on the way. The first story we look at today is the story of Job found in the Old Testament in the book of Job, chapter 1 and 2. If you have a Bible with you or an app of some kind, go ahead and turn there. The book of Job, chapter number 1. If you don't have the scripture, that's all right. A lot of our scripture will be on the screen today, just not this first part. The sermon today asks this question. Here it is. What do I do when I've lost everything? How many of you have ever been in a time where it seems like one bad thing is happening after another? It's just like one thing and then the next thing and the next thing. And you keep thinking to yourself, why doesn't it pace itself? Why is it all coming out? When it rains, it pours is the idea. If you've ever been there, this is the story for you. Job chapter 1 and verse 1, it introduces us to our main character for the day. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. That means he avoided doing evil things. Now, after you read this verse, how many of you think Job was a pretty good guy? How many of you think from this verse, Job was a pretty good guy? Say amen. Some of you aren't sure. Look at the verse again. Look what it says. It says he was a man that was perfect and upright. He feared God and he avoided evil. He sounds like a pretty good guy, amen? A pretty good guy. But we find Job in the darkest moment of his life. When we are introduced to Job, he is going through the darkest moment of his life. In the story of Job, if you've ever read it, you need to read it sometime. The story of Job begins this way. It tells us everything was fine, and then he goes through a dark moment. Then his friends come around him and tell him how bad he was, and that it ends with God talking to him and then blessing him like he's never been blessed before. So it is the journey of a man who goes through a very difficult, difficult time. And I want you to know this is that we begin today. We're going to pick up in verse 13 in a moment. As we begin this main truth for today's sermon, here it is. What you say and what you declare in the darkest moments will determine your direction. Get this truth. Get it. What you say, what you declare in the darkest moments of your life will determine your direction. It's not a matter of if we go through a dark moment. It's a matter of when we go through a dark moment. No matter how strong your marriage, your marriage will go through a dark moment. No matter how good your relationship with your kids, it's going to go through a dark moment. No matter how, how great job is or your career is or, or everything that's going in your life, there are dark moments that God allows us to go through and you need to be prepared for them. So why am I sharing this with you? Because as you are ready to go through that dark moment, as you go through the dark moment, understand this. What you say, what you declare during that time will determine much of your direction. Now, we also understand this truth, that it is out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So what we think about, what is deep in our hearts will determine what we say, and what we say will determine much of our direction. I'm going to prove that as I go through the story today of the story of Job who goes through quite a dark moment. And by the way, what he says is the right thing. He declares with confidence the right thing. He says the right thing at the right time. How many of you have ever said the wrong thing at the wrong time? <laughs> How many of you are like me? You're, you're not always on cue saying the right thing. Sometimes you say the wrong thing. How many of you like that? I, I've said some incredibly embarrassing things to some people. I will not uh, share all of those, but I will tell you this. One of the places that the most amazing conversations and awkward conversations happen for me in my life 
are Sunday mornings after church when I'm greeting people as they leave. Um, I love going out here. I love that in our church. I stand out there. People shake hands and saying hi to people as they go by. And hi, Pastor. How are you doing? And some of the greatest moments happen, you know, talking to these people. And also some of the weirdest moments happen. Uh, talking, for example, I remember, <laughs> I remember last year when we were doing four services in our old facility and it was cram-packed every week. I couldn't keep up with all the new faces and still that's the case today. And, and I was standing out there. I shook the hand of a man as he came by and I said to him, I said, I'm so glad you came today. Welcome to our church. Is this your first time? And he shook my hand and said, Pastor, I've been a member for three years. How many of you realize that is not a good thing for a pastor to admit, right? But it's not just me that says dumb things. Sometimes dumb things are said to me. You know the number one thing that people say to me as, I, as they walk out when they're new to the church? They'll walk back, they'll shake my hand, they'll look down and say, I thought you'd be taller. That is not nice. You're not allowed to say that anymore. Even if you think it, don't say it. I had a guy one time stop by, and I thought, man, that Sunday I was ready for my sermon. I came, I was preaching like with power. I'm a great preacher, say amen. All right, yeah, <laughs> thank you. I was just cam, but I'll take it, you know. And I was ready, man. I was preaching. I was excited about my sermon. I got up. I preached my best. I did the best I could. And as I was walking out, shook the hand, guy looked at me, and he said, wasn't one of your best. <laughs> like, what? Was, you know, thank you. <laughs> and then he said this. He said, but I think you're getting better. So at least, that, you know, that was good. That was good. So some of these, are, so you ever say the wrong thing at the wrong time? There's nothing worse than saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. There's nothing better than saying the right thing at the right time. In fact, the book of Proverbs says that a word spoken in the right time, a word fitly spoken, is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. It's beautiful when you say the right thing at the right time. Here's the truth. When you go through a dark moment, there are some right things you should say. And there are some wrong things you ought not say. Job says the right things at the right time. He's in a dark moment, so let me describe the dark moment he's in. I'll do it by reading the story itself. Look at, look at verse, and then I'll go through and tell you what we ought to say, what you shouldn't say, but look at what it says in verse 13. I'm going to tell you the story for those who don't know it. It says in verse 13, and there was a day in Job's life when the sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. Job's family was having a party in his oldest son's house. They were having a good time, a nice party. Um, I always wonder why Job wasn't invited, but he wasn't, but he wasn't allowed to go for some reason. And I just want to declare to my children that if you ever have a party, you need to invite your dad. Amen. All right, there it is. But Job was not there. They're all celebrating. And look at what happens in this one day. Look what happens. The Bible says in verse 14, and a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took, a, took them away, and they have slain your servants with the edge of the sword, and only I am alone escaped to tell thee. Job is just at his home, and all of a sudden, somebody comes to him, one of his servants, and says, you know, all of your cattle and all of your donkeys, they were out in the fields, and all of a sudden, the enemies came, and they took all of your cattle and your donkeys, and they killed all of the servants. I'm the only one left. Man, that's bad news. Then it goes on, it says, and while he was yet speaking, while he was yet speaking, there came another servant and said, the fire of God has fallen down from heaven and burned up the sheep and thy servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped to the elderly. Not only are your cattle and your donkeys gone, but also your sheep are destroyed. Look at the next verse. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said unto him, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried, away, carried them away. Yea, they slain thy servants with the edge of the sword, and I only and alone escaped to tell thee. In one day he finds out that his cattle, his sheep, and his camels were all destroyed. How many of you know what that's like? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, we own. We don't have camels and sheep. But that would be like all of your bank accounts being completely destroyed, all of your retirement, everything that you had saved up. You're in your 60s, 70s years old. You've worked your entire life for what you have. And in one moment, it's gone. Gone. But that's what he finds out at the beginning of the day. Look at what it says in the next verse. While he was yet speaking, there came another servant and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and it smote the four corners of the house, and it fell down upon the young men, and they are all dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. I have three children. I, 
I don't know what it would be like to lose a child. I don't know what it would be like to lose a child. I, I can't imagine losing one, let alone all of your children, all in the same day. In the same day, Job loses his children. He loses his wealth. What a miserable existence. Look at verse 22. And in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. You know what's easy for us to do? Listen, it's easy in the dark moment to shake our fist in the face of God and say, What are you doing to me? But Job did not do this. Now, this is a bad day, but look, the story goes on in chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, and so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job. Some of you think, well, at least he has his health. The problem is the next verse tells us that he doesn't. He smote Job with boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He now lost his health. He has boils coming from the bottom of his feet, big, nasty boils that burst and pus coming out and up his legs and through his torso around his neck to the top of his head. And the Bible says in the next verse, he takes broken pieces of shards of clay and he begins to scrape the wounds to make it feel better. His wealth is gone, his health is gone, his children are dead, but at least he has a loving wife. Look at verse 9. And then said his wife unto him, Do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. Sounds like a lovely woman, doesn't she? <laughs> nice, lovely, encouraging young lady. <laughs> Goodness. Here's the question. What are you going to say at that moment? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Dark moments come. I don't care how great you are, how wonderful you are, how perfect you are, we all go through dark moments. We learn this because part of God's plan is to grow us and shape us and strengthen us and to make us more and more like Christ. And if we are more and more like Christ, we're gonna go through times of suffering. Here's the reality. You're going to go through times of suffering. The question is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The question really is, what do you say? What do you do? And what we see Job say whew, leads to the most beautiful ending of a story you can find in the Bible. God blesses Job beyond measure because of how he responds. In fact, in the end of Job's story, after everybody criticizes him, God gives him double what he had before. He gave him double for his trouble, we see at the end of the story. But it's based upon God's grace and goodness and by what Job declares in my favorite chapter in the book of Job, and that's Job chapter 19. Turn to Job chapter 19 if you have a Bible with you or an app open. If not, most of it would be on the screen. Here is Job chapter 19. It tells us what we should say when everything is out of control. What we should declare when we feel like everything's going haywire. And I'm telling you, these three things are going to change your life. Number one, what we learn that Job says, number one, is that my Redeemer is alive. I want you to say it with me. My Redeemer is alive. One more time, my Redeemer is alive. alive. One more time, say it with some passion, my Redeemer, my Redeemer is alive. It's true, no matter what happens in your life, we know this, God is still God, he's on the throne, and he's still in control. Look at what he says in chapter 19 and verse 25. Job says, in the midst of his darkness, for I know that my Redeemer lives. It's very simplistic, and it goes right down to the heart of where we really need to be. Hear this. It doesn't matter who you can't count on, because there is one you can always count on. It doesn't matter who is gone from your life. There is one who will never leave you nor forsake you. It doesn't matter who is dead that you used to count on, because Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, is always alive. Please grasp this. In the darkest moment, declare it out loud. Say it to God and to the devil and to the world around you. My Redeemer is alive. 
One of the biggest things the devil's going to try to convince you of in your darkest moment is that God is not there to help. But Job declares, I know that my Redeemer lives. He could not say that of others. He could not say that of his brothers, his friends, his family, his neighbors, his wife. He could not say that. In fact, the context of verse verse 25 is in verse number 13. Look at verse 13 on the screen. This is part of the same chapter. Before he declares, my Redeemer is alive, he says this. Now ask yourself if you've ever been there. He has removed my brothers far from me. Have you ever been in a place where you could not count on even your brothers? My relatives have failed me. Have you ever been in a place where you could not even count on your family? My close friends have forgotten me. Have you ever been in a place where even your closest friends would not be there for you? Or if you explained what you tried to explain to them, they would end up blaming you and blaming your problems on yourself. And there was literally no one you could turn to. That's where Job was. Job had no one. Even his servants, the people that worked for him. He said, I said to my servants, but they did not answer me. I begged them with my mouth and they did not come. He said, I can't even find one person in this world that I can trust to share my burdens with. Nobody. Now, I got to tell you, there's nothing better than having friends, having even a church community, having a small group, having people in your life that you can trust. Aren't you thankful for godly friendships? Can I get an amen? Amen. Sure, family is a wonderful thing. Friends are a wonderful thing. But get this true. Hear this with your ears now. Every one of us, I believe, at one point in your life will be brought to a point where you have no one to turn to. And God will do this to you and allow this in your life for one reason. So that when you have no one to turn to, there is only one you can turn to. And that's God. That's what he's saying. He's removed my brothers from me. My relatives have failed. My close friends have forgotten me. My servants are gone. He gave me, they gave me no answer. I begged him with my mouth. This is my next, my favorite verse in this chapter. My breath is offensive to my wife. How many of you men can understand exactly that one right there? Amen. (laughs) What he's saying here is this. He wasn't trying to be funny. He was saying, I can't even speak to my wife without her yelling at me. Men, women, we will all go through this. Why? All my close friends have abhorred me, they, they, and, they who, uh, and they whom I love have turned against me. This is my belief. I believe that God will allow every single person to go through this moment. Why? So that when we get to the point where we have no one, we remember we still have him. We still have him. We still have Christ. This is why it is incredibly important for you to develop your relationship with Jesus so that when others are not there for you, you can go to him always. Always having Christ with you because that's exactly what's happening in Job's story. When you can't count on anyone, you can always count on Jesus. Can I get an amen right there? Listen, here's why. Because there are moments in your life that nobody else is going to understand but you and Jesus. When you hear that diagnosis that it's cancer and it's not going away, there is only one person that will be able to give you the comfort you need, and that is your relationship with God. When you're going through chronic pain that others try to empathize with, they really try to say, oh, that's sorry, I'm sorry you're going through that chronic pain. No one really can other than your relationship with Jesus. When you're going through that divorce and others are constantly blaming you, when you're going through abandonment and they've walked away from you, when your business fails or you lose your job or you go through the death of a loved one and you think, who is there that can understand this pain? The answer is one. You can declare with certainty, my Redeemer's alive. Even when others have abandoned me and forsaken me, I know there is one who understands what it is to be in a garden and have all of his friends run away. What I'm imploring you before I leave this first point is this. When you are in that dark moment, don't blame God. Run to God. This is the mistake we as humans often make. We we sit around and we think, oh God, what did you do to me? And the only person who can give us comfort, the only person who can truly understand, the only person who can save us from our sorrow is him. But instead of running to him, we run from him. Instead of embracing him, we reject him. And how foolish we are to do so. 
Don't declare your fear of the situation. Declare your faith in God. This is exactly what Job does. He states right there in chapter 19 and verse 25, I know one thing, I know my Redeemer is alive. Say it with me. My Redeemer is alive. Say it with me. My Redeemer is alive. Here's the second thing he declares in the most, most moment of his darkness. Number two, my Redeemer has a plan. How many of you are thankful that God knows what he's doing? Can I get an amen? amen. How many of you believe God knows what he's doing, right? Have you ever thought about giving job, God a job, um, you know, a a job review. You know, an annual review. Sit God down in December. <laughs> Sit him down at your desk. All right, God, have a seat. Thank you for coming in. Done a good job with the weather this year. A little worried about the global warming thing, but we'll see. You ever thought about that? Giving God a job review at the end of the year. Then you can, you know, give him a Christmas bonus. You say, that's a terrible thing for you to think. Why, why would you say such a thing? Well, because we often do this, right? We often critique God on how well he's being God. You know, you did well there, you did that well. But, you know, if I were you, I would have done it a little different. Well, guess what? You're not God. <laughs> Probably you and I would not do as good of a job as God does with his own job. Do you believe that God has a plan today? If you do, say amen. amen. Look at what he says in verse, verse 25. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand at last on the earth. That Lex phrase is extremely important. Job is speaking eschatologically. What I mean by that is, he's speaking of the end days. He's talking about the final days. He's saying this, I know my Redeemer, Messiah, Jesus, I know he's alive, and I also know that one day in the last days, he's gonna stand on the earth. I may not know what's going on now, but I know he has a plan and he's working all things together for good. I may not understand what's going on in this moment, but I do know that it all fits together for his glory and for God's, God's goodness. You see, this is what he's stating so very clearly. He's stating what Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 says. Colossians 1 is beautiful. It says this, Jesus has delivered us from the power of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of, of his dear son or the father has. What does that mean? It means that God the Father has saved us out of darkness and brought us in to the kingdom of light through Jesus Christ. It is only him that could have done this. It has redeemed us through his blood and forgiveness of sins. I ask it every week, so bear with me. I'm going to do it again. How many of you have ever sinned before? You've broken God's laws, you've disobeyed, you've made mistakes. How many of you are like Josh, you've sinned? Raise your hand with me, all right? Some of you are doing so. Praise God. All right, so sinners. The Bible says this, because of our sin, we deserve punishment for our sin. Damnation in a place called hell. But Jesus Christ came. He died upon the cross to pay for our sins, was buried and rose from the grave. And the Bible says that it's through Christ that we have the redemption of sin and we have forgiveness and we have a home in, a home in heaven through salvation in Christ. So what's my point? My point is through Jesus Christ and him alone, you can be saved, hear me. If you've never received Christ as your savior, you come to this church. You think, man, I like it here. You know, they have nice people, nice music. Pastor Josh is awesome. <laughs> come on, all right, all right. But you haven't yet personally been converted. You've not yet personally received Jesus as your savior. You ought to do so. You say, why? Because it is Jesus Christ and him alone who can save us and give us purpose for the plans that we're going through. He does have a plan. My wife, Heather, likes to um, do puzzles. How many of you, how many of you ever do these puzzles? Big 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzles. Anybody here ever do these? Um, you, yeah, the, patience is what it takes. Every Christmas, my wife will get a new puzzle, and she'll put it out on the dining room table. And what we do is we go by and we work on it. Now, how many of you a a actually have that Christmas tradition? Raise your hand. How many of you do that? Okay, a few of you do. I don't know where she got this tradition, but we do this every year. She'll put out the puzzle, and we'll put it out. It's a beautiful thing to do. Now, one of the jokes that we play every single year is that one of us will go and take one piece and we'll hide it so that we are, could be the person that puts the last piece in the puzzle. The pro How many of you have ever done that before? How many of you think that is really villainous? You're a bad person too. Hey, all right, very good. 
Oh, hold down to that piece. Now, the problem is our kids have picked up on this. So by, when the, we finish the puzzle every Christmas, there are five pieces missing. <laughs> so I have to go around and find the five pieces, you know. You know, one of these days, I know this is going to happen. I know I'm going to find one of those pieces. And I know it's going to be like, oh, man, it was my pocket. And it's like, you know, March now, and I forgot where it was. And that's why my wife is angry with me still, you know. And you pull out that piece, and you think about that piece. And if you look at that piece, apart from the rest of the puzzle, it seems to make no sense. I mean, it's got strange, jagged cuts. It's got a strange circular pattern here. It's got strange colors and a strange design. And by itself, that piece makes no sense. But if you took that piece and you placed it in the context of the rest of the picture, it makes a beautiful image for everyone to enjoy. Do you know the problem with each and every one of us when we face our dark moment? is that by itself, we focus solely on that dark moment. We look at it and we say, it doesn't make sense, all those cuts and all those curves and those strange colors, and it just makes no sense. But the reality is, when you take that piece and place it in the context of the beautiful picture that is your life, the tapestry that God is creating, one day you'll be able to look at it and the entire painting will make beautiful, perfect sense. This is exactly what Job is declaring when he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that he will stand on the earth in the latter day. I know that he has a plan, and all these things will work together for good. That's what Romans chapter 8 in the New Testament says. It says, and we know that all these things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose. We know that God is doing these things for his glory and our good. Listen. Look at the life of Job and see the good that came from his darkness. Look at his life. We know that when we look at his life, that what the devil meant for, to destroy him, God used to make him stronger. What the devil is meaning to destroy you, God is using to make you stronger. We have a sadistic segment in our society a sadistic group of people that live in our society. We call them coaches, gym teachers, and personal trainers. They are sadistic. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Every time I see my personal trainer, last time I saw him was in January. <laughs> I'll see him again, I'm sure. You know, it's interesting. All of these personal trainers, coaches, gym teachers, they all have the same, uh, they all have varying techniques and philosophies, but they all seem to have the same motto. They say, no pain. No pain. Let me tell you one. No pain. No pain. Shut up. That's what I want to say. Again. I mean, you understand what they're saying. You've got to go through the difficulty in order to get stronger. I've seen this to be true, haven't you? Man, I've watched Christians. I have watched Christians go through the darkest moments, and I've watched how God has used those dark pressures to bring out brilliant, shining diamonds on the other side. Look at the life of Job. That's exactly what happens in the life of Job. Job becomes stronger because he goes through the dark moment. But not only do we see that in the life of Job, we also see that not only does it become stronger, Job actually is able to help others because he goes through the dark moment. Could it be that the dark moment that you're in is not only making you stronger, but the darkness that you're facing is planned by God so that you can help others down the road? That God can use your darkness to actually come along and help others who genuinely need help. Think of Job. Here's a question for you Bible theologians that really might shock you. Who wrote the book of Job? Some of you that are really, really smart, you're going to say, God wrote the book of Job. <laughs> I know. I got, God wrote, how many of you believe God wrote the Bible? Amen? Yeah, I get that. But who actually was the penman who sat down and wrote the story about what happened to Job? Who was it? You can study throughout all the commentaries you want. There are really basically three ideas of who may have written it. One idea is that it was Job himself. 
Another idea what is his good friend, Elihu, who writes it, and the other one is that it's one of the other friends. It, it was either Job or a close friend of Job who wrote Job's story. You say, what's the point? I've heard people teach on Job my entire life, and people will often say this. People will often say, poor Job, he never understood why all of this was happening. Not true. Not true. Because somewhere, at some point, he or someone close to him wrote the story so he understood why it was happening. See, what's the point? The point is this. Job went through darkness. It not only made him stronger, he was now able to help others for millennia to come because of what he went through. What I'm telling you is this. Maybe what you're going through is so that one day you can help others with it. That's what happened with Candy. Candy was the proud mother of three in Central California. When her youngest, Carrie, was 13 years old, she asked if she could go down the road to a church carnival, and she walked with her friends. And as she walked with her friends, Carrie crossed the street, she looked both ways, she did everything she could, but out of nowhere, a car came and smashed right into that 13-year-old little girl. The car hit her so hard, it literally tore the shoes off of her feet and sent Carrie flying down the road. Carrie was dead. And Candy, Candy was heartbroken. You know, in these moments, we often want to put a question mark where God put a period. Why? The answer is, the question is not why. The answer is, it happened. But why? It's not about why. It's about what now. So what would Candy do? Would she get bitter? Or would she grow better? Later, Candy found out that her daughter was not only struck by an irresponsible driver, she was struck by a drunk driver. Tragedy is one thing, but a needless tragedy even worse. Why, God, why? No why, what now? Candy decided to use all the passion that she was feeling and all the emotion that she would feel in turning around and helping mothers. This is where she created Mothers Against Drunk Driving Mad. She decided to use her pain and use her dark moment to advance society in a way that we needed. And it is because of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, we have so many laws on the books now that save our families and save children from the incredible problem of intoxicated driving even to this day. What we've seen because of Candy's influence is a change in society. You say, why did it happen? I'm glad Candy didn't focus on the why, she focused on the what now. You spend the rest of your life questioning God's why. Why did it happen this way? Why didn't it happen another way? You can basically say this piece of puzzle doesn't make sense and I'm not gonna wait to see the whole picture. I'm just gonna be upset about this piece of puzzle. Or you can just embrace what's going on in your life and say, what God are you doing in me? You're making me stronger and you want me to help others? Fantastic. God, I wanna do what you want me to do. How many of you in the room believe that God has a plan? See, here's the truth. As your pastor, when you go through a dark moment, I don't want you to simply go through your dark moment. I want you to grow through your dark moments. I don't want you to simply survive. I want you to thrive because of the darkness. God allows these dark moments in our life for his reason and his reason alone. We grow through a season of darkness in order to birth something new on the inside that is part of God's plan. And this is what Job understood, did he not? What Job understood here is, number one, he would declare, my Redeemer is alive. Say it with me. My Redeemer is alive. Say it with me. My Redeemer is alive. Number two, he understood this. My Redeemer has a plan. Say it with me. My Redeemer has a plan. Say it with me. My Redeemer has a plan. Number three, he declared, lastly, one day, one day I will see it clearly. This is one of the most difficult things for me as a pastor to look into the eyes of a dear person, a saint, a lover of God when they're going through a tragedy. 
and say, I don't know why. And the answer is, you may not know why either for a long, long time. But here's the promise. Here it is. Please get it. One day you will see it clearly. Here's my promise. No matter what darkness you're going through, the promise of God is one day you're going to understand why. That's what Job sees. Look at verse 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand in the last days. But then what he says, look what he says. And after my skin is destroyed, yet in my flesh will I see God whom I will see for myself. He says, one day, I don't understand why it's happening now, but one day this skin will fall off of me and I'll be given a new body and stand in my flesh and I will see God for myself and my eyes will behold and him not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. He's saying, oh, I want to see God because I want to understand why all this is happening. I'm not going to understand right now, but one day when I die and I stand before God, I will see him. And when I see him, I will understand all these things, but it may not be until then that I understand these things. This is not a doctrine that is solely found in the book of Job. For 1 Corinthians says the same thing. For now we see through a dark glass leaf, but then we'll see face to face. Now we know some things in part, but then we shall know all things fully. The psalmist says the same thing. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I will be, sanct I will be satisfied when I awaken your likeness. One day I will see you, and because I see you, I will understand all these things. Here's the promise. I don't know why you're going through the darkness. Neither do you, perhaps, in this moment. But when you see God, it will be made clear to you. So what do I do in the meantime? Declare that truth. See, instead of declaring, I don't know where God is, declare, I know he's alive. Instead of declaring, I don't know if he has a plan, declare, I don't know what his plan is, but I know I can trust him. Instead of declaring, I'll never know what's wrong with this, you declare, I may not know now, but one day I'll see it clearly. It all comes down to whether or not you trust God. The Bible says that the just, that is those of us who are saved, we're supposed to live by faith. I'm going to say the verse, you, you give me the last word, it's faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. That means day by day, we are to step out in faith, trusting God. It really is a matter of whether or not, not what God knows what he's doing, whether or not you trust that he knows where he's going. My, uh, my son is 13 now. My son. My dear idiot child. Some of you are offended, I know. It's because you don't have a 13-year-old right now, okay. I love my boy. We had some good times. We went on a family trip this last week, and we had some fun. My son, he's 13. He's not, he's not an idiot now. He's always been one. He's <laughs> <laughs> I know you're going to email me. I know. All right. All right. I remember when he was just a little boy. Um, he, uh, he, he, he thinks a little differently than I do on a lot of things, we, we're different people. And uh, I remember him sitting back, he, we look similar, but he, we're very different. In fact, he's just so excited right now because he's almost taller than me. <laughs> Which, relax, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> Most people are taller than me, okay. <laughs> and he's like right there, he's always standing beside me, he's like, hey, I'm like, dude, l chill out. <laughs> little, little punk. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, Craig, <laughs> I've seen your son. That's right. He's sitting, he's sitting uh, I remember as a kid, he would, um, I mean, just this age, three, four years old, he's sitting in the back of the car seat, and I'm driving along. This would happen, I'm telling you, a lot of times. I'm driving along, and he would say, uh, <clears throat> Dad? He would ask questions. He always asked questions. Stupid questions. He said, <laughs> he said, Dad? I said, what, son? He said, I think you're going the wrong way. Uh, here he is, sitting in a car seat, Sipping on apple juice in a sippy cup. <laughs> and he's going to tell me I should have turned left on Flamingo, not right. <laughs> How many of you, your children ever ask you if you're going the wrong way as you're driving? Ridiculous, right? Like, who do you think you are? <laughs> you're a kid. Watch VeggieTales and go to sleep. <laughs> Leave me alone. I know where I'm going. But they question as if they know. 
hey, Dad, I think you're going the wrong way. How ridiculous is it <laughs> for us to sit in the back seat and question the Father when the Father clearly knows where he's going? The Father clearly has the plan outlined. Job, in the middle of this terrible moment, he had to sit back and rationalize and think, okay, wait a second, I know God's alive. I know he has a plan. And though I don't see it now, one day I will. And that declaration determined his direction. At the end of the story of Job, it's beautiful. I mean, it's awesome. God comes and speaks to Job. God comes and speaks. It's a beautiful ending. And then God blesses Job. He doubles everything that Job had. His sorrow, I'm sure, was still there, but God blessed him. In fact, I've heard people say God gave him double for his trouble. Double camels, double donkeys, double, you know, what's your love? Just double donkeys, amen? I mean, God has just blessed him all over. Double children, the whole thing. Really, it's an amazing... Get the same amount, but the point is, God blessed. It was an amazing story. What's the point? The point is this. I believe it was only by God's grace that God blessed Job. But I believe that his determination to declare faith in the midst of darkness determined his direction for the rest of his life. What will you declare in the moment of darkness? Will you declare faith or fear? Will you run to God or away from God? We see in the first story, what you do when you lose everything is to declare that which is right. Let us pray. Oh. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world. 